And welcome to AFL Rewind, a look back at all things arena football, sponsored by Phenom Elite. I'm your host, Tim Capper. John and Ben are not able to make it for this episode, but first and foremost, I want to thank all of the listeners uh, for listening to our inaugural episode, and I think the feedback and the numbers of the uh, of you who listened uh, actually proved why we needed to bring and start this series of historical podcasts. Uh, it is, you know, it is one of those series, just like with Dan Radabaugh in our first episode, where we would hope that the players, former executives, et cetera, would be able to speak their minds and, and to let us inside, uh, you know, let us inside to know about their history and to know about the goings on in the Arena Football League. So, all I can say is when we get to the interview this episode, it is going to be absolutely mind blowing. So I can say to you, get your popcorn ready and get ready to be a fly on the wall as we speak to a gentleman who was an integral part of the early days of the Arena Football League. Get ready because there's so much information that I learned from our conversation. And I, and I thought I knew everything about this league. I learned so much, and I hope you do too. Commissioner Joseph O'Hara. Well, with this this episode is a gentleman who uh, has quite a few ties within the Arena Football League, uh, and also was one of part of the ownership group for wow, I could possibly say two of the uh, of the biggest name franchises in league history. But we'll get that a little bit more. But also, this gentleman was also the second league commissioner. With us is Joseph O'Hara. Joe, thanks for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, what we wanted to find out first is that, uh, obviously, we, we know you were a part of the whole expansion process with the Firebirds back in 1990, but before you joined the Arena Football League and, and, uh, and Glenn Missoula, what were you doing? Well, the, the sports uh, part of our world was a sidelight. You know, it was something that I was very interested in. Um, when I moved back to the Albany area, I had been uh, lived in not far from Albany growing up, and then I actually lived in the Albany area for several years, mm-hmm. uh, and then I was off and around the country. But when I came back to the area, uh, the Knickerbocker Arena was just being built, and I had been in several cities where I had watched the cities rebuild around something like the Knickerbocker Arena. I was in Albany when... Uh, I'm sorry, in Boston, when Fano Hall, when that whole the process went through and it changed the city forever. And I was in Missouri when St. Louis did a tremendous renovation downtown. And you know, so I, I thought that there was a good chance that Albany with the arena had a chance to become, um, you know, a, a bigger sports town than it was. I mean, if you looked at the metro area, at the time, I don't know what the numbers are now, but it was about 1.1, 1.2 million. It was, it was one of the largest, um, you know, what they call them SMSAs, but it was one of the largest urban areas without a professional level team. So I got involved when the Knickerbock Arena came into play, and the year before that happened, uh, I had talked to Glenn and convinced him that buying the Albany Patroons team and the Continental Basketball Association was a great idea. And so we started with that. We had the Albany Patroons for two years before we got involved with the Arena League. How did you end up finding about, uh, hearing about the Arena League? Did you know somebody, mm-hmm. like, do you know, did you know Jim Foster or, or Jerry Kurz? Or did you know somebody that actually told you about it? Or did somebody approach you about, uh, about joining the, the ownership group and, and getting a, uh, an AFL team for Albany? Uh, we were actually approached. Uh, they reached out to us. Uh, they knew they were looking at cities. They were trying to find cities that might support an arena team. Um, the Patroons, as you may or may not know, was one of the most successful teams ever in the Continental Basketball Association. I mean, we we had you know set records in terms of uh, the teams that we had in terms of attendance and everything else, and we moved from what was a small 3,200-seat arena, the Washington Armory, into Knickerbocker Arena. And then we, and the CBA, of, of course, folded, and that's another whole story of the, the demise of that league. But 
I'm I'm sure we we held the record of you know at all time for CBA. I'd, we put in thirteen thousand plus for our opening game in the Knickerbocker Arena. So so they came to us. They knew we we were operating a sports franchise and um, you know well regarded one. You know, we had, we uh, brought in top quality coaches, top quality players, and that was the same approach we had on the Arena Week. How did you get involved with Glenn Missoula to be part ownership? I mean, it's uh, obviously, you know, a, a, an ownership group has to get together somehow. Did you know Glenn prior to uh, joining the ownership group? Yeah, we were we were business partners um, in a totally unrelated businesses. I mean, we, we owned and operated a, another consulting firm. And I came to Glenn with the idea of buying the Patroons, um, you know, I won't say he was he was in favor of it right away, but he came around and you know it was it was it was a mutual investment we made. Um, I'd been around sports all my life, and I really thought the, that we had a chance because of the Knickerbocker Arena. I thought we had a chance to really start out with a CBA team, and at some point look to you know bring in a a first tier level team into the Albany area. Mm-hmm. And there's there's lots of reasons why that never has happened and probably never will happen. But, you know, if you look at the area, again, in terms of the numbers, the numbers are there. But there are lots of reasons why it's never happened. But, uh, no, Glenn and I have been in business together for, I don't know, three, four years uh, when I came in with the platoons idea. And once we made the decision to go ahead, we bought the team uh, and operated, as I said, we operated that for a couple of years. And then uh, we were approached. We were approached by several leagues. I mean, it wasn't the Arena League wasn't the only league. Okay, and it wasn't the only other sports franchise we looked at. Uh, but it was the one. It was the first one after the Patroons that we uh, purchased and became part of. Do you remember the day that you guys and the whole? I guess when the Albany Times Union made the announcement that they would be receiving an Arena Football League team. Does that does that date stand out to you, or was it, was it not as? Or was the prop and circumstance not as big as it is today when a new team is announced? I don't remember that. I remember the meeting that we went to Mm -hmm. where we were, uh, there was a presentation done by Jim Foster, uh, Jerry Kurz, Bill Nyro. Those were the the three uh, main characters. And there were a couple of coaches there. Um, I happened to sit next to him, became very good friends with Dave Pirelli. Uh, you know, I'd grown up watching Bay, so um, it was kind of funny sitting next to him in a meeting. And you know, he was he was someone that was passionate about the game, and uh, I, I think certainly he, he uh, had an influence in, in my interest. Uh, again, you know, we were looking at it as an investment. The uh, we already had a front office. It was, in many respects, the per- perfect complement. You know, we played basically from November to April with the arena, I mean, with the uh, Continental Basketball Association. So this was filling in the, the, the months we didn't have anything to do. So it was, it was a, it was a perfect compliment as far as I was concerned. Uh, knowing the history and people need to remember too, at this time, you know, the league has only been around since 1987 and I'm sure, you know, after being approached, you had heard the, uh, you know, the, the ups and downs that the that the league had had faced, did that sway you and and Glenn in any way to saying you know what maybe we don't want to join the AFL or or was it was did did uh, uh, Jim Foster was able to 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 convince you that everything was going to be okay? Um, I, you know I think I think a couple things I, I think the the fact that we had a a sports team already mm-hmm. and all the um, you know, all the accompanying costs. I mean, we had a, you know, we had a staff, we okay. had an office, we are, you know, so again, I think for others, you know, if I, if I remember the, the other people that came in at the time, uh, the Dallas team came in at the same time, yeah. uh, Gary Vito and the, the Detroit team, you know, they, Gary was, you know, next to Babe, probably the most passionate man I ever met about the arena league. Um, you know, Meeting the other owners, hearing what they had to say. Certainly, you know, you got Mike Illich, yeah. um, you know, owns the Detroit Red Wings, owns the Tigers. Uh, you know, you, you, you got to feel good about that. Um, the um, 
trying to remember the guy's name out of out of Dallas is uh, Lamar Lamar Richie or something. That's not quite right, but anyway, I liked him a lot. He was a good guy. Um, Babe was in Denver. I can't quite remember the group out there. Uh, they came together late. There was a guy in D.C. that turned out to be a total fraud. That's an interesting story just before the start of the, the season. Um, but, you know, part of it was it fit in with what we already had, and there was enough meat there mm-hmm. uh, that I thought, you know, w- w- the league looked like it could make it if it had good owners. The ownership groups that came in, for the most part, turned out to be okay. Um, you know, we had the glitch in D.C., but that happened. Now, uh, obviously, you get the team is announced. <laughs> you obviously have to start the whole process of deciding to who you're going to have as head coach, uh, et cetera, you know, and the players. But I'm sure there's something in that even I don't know, you know, being a fan uh, who actually attended his first, his AFL game in Albany in 93, in um, fans may want to know how – did the Firebirds name come about? Would you would, would you be able to tell us that, Joe? It's a funny story. Um, it was not our first choice. Our, our first, and, and and since I was the one uh, making these decisions, I can tell you very clearly what happened. So our first choice was Nighthawks, and we submitted our name. And Jim Foster called me and said. Oh man, you know, I'm I'm really sorry, but um, I'm planning at some point to have a team in the league, and that's the name I always wanted to use for my team. And so, if you guys come up with another name, and I happened to be driving at the time, I was I was going to our offices in Boston, and and which were our offices were in the same building, the the next door building to the old Boston Garden. Mm-hmm. So I was literally getting off the the expressway and coming down into the where the Boston Garden, the old Boston Garden is. And I was on I was on my car phone and I this is the old days when you still had those phones, you know, with those cords and everything tied in. And I was like, God damn. So I got off the phone with Foster and I literally looked in front of me and the car in front of me was A Firebird. A, a Firebird. <laughs> and I said, That's not a bad name. We could we could do something with that. And so I called Foster back. I was still in the car. I hadn't gotten out of the car. And I called him back. I said, how about Firebirds? And he said, yeah, that's great. And that's where the Firebirds came from. Were, then, were, were the colors always going to be orange and black, even if it had been Nighthawks? Yes. I mean, we hadn't settled on, on that kind of stuff. But in, uh, in my mind, yeah, that okay. was kind of the, that was the color thing we were going to go with. Um, we hired a graphic artist. Um who came in and did a couple designs, and uh, I still think the Firebirds. I, I, I'm amazed more teams haven't. I, you know, I look at the XFL and some of the god awful names they come up with for teams, <laughs> um, and and the uniforms couldn't be worse. I mean, they, I, I just look at it and go, God damn, we were we did better than that, uh, and we didn't know what we were doing. And, and um, you know, I, I still think Firebirds is a great name. I think the original logo. It was a great logo. I still have one of those T-shirts someplace. That, and so yeah, I was very happy with the with the name, but it was not. And most of I don't know anyone other than Glenn would know that that was not our first choice in Jim Foster. That's interesting, and I will admit to I can actually say that I think to this day, uh, you know, uh, that the uh, Firebirds helmet is probably one of the most iconic ones for you know for the early AFL. Uh, I think next to the next to the Iowa Barnstormers because you had the wings and you had the bird's head and it wasn't at its normal yeah. place that you would think that a, a, a bird's head would be, but it, it just happened to work, especially on that, on that pearl white helmet. So it looked, it looked yep. fantastic. Yeah. 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 And the players, uh, players love the name. They love the, you know, I mean, you know, we, we went through that couple of seasons with the Zubas, but you know, we were getting uniforms for free. So, you know, you had to do some certain things. And, but other than that, you know, I, I, I always thought we had done a, it was a it was a, a great look. I thought yes. there, weren't, there weren't any teams in the league that we, you know, you know. I played ball. And sometimes I mean, you look across the field. Sometimes and you just play a team in high school from uh, Lee Mass, and I swear to God that 
they, they weren't bad players, but they were a horrible team. And I think a lot of it had to do with their uniforms. And this guy, I just felt sorry for him all the time. They, they always looked funny. But anyway, the Firebirds, uh, that's how the name came about. And the colors were, we were pretty well locked into the black and orange uh, immediately. I mean, it, it was all the original graphics um, were, th- those were the colors. You know, we had, we had some gray in there and some white, but I mean, the black and the orange were the two colors we had gone for. Now, obviously, as I say, you, now you have your name, you have your, your colors and you have your look. You have to decide on, on who's going to be the head coach for the, you know, for the inaugural season for the, for the Firebirds. And, and you ended up hiring uh, Rick Buffington, um, obviously a very known, well-known name in the Arena Football League. Um, but how did you end up come about hiring Coach Buff? Very easy. Dave Perilli called me and said, you're looking for a coach? And I said, yes, we are. And he said, you know, I think you ought to take a look at Rick Buffington. So we took a look at Rick Buffington. And Rick came in. I liked Rick right away. Um, he had, you know, I... I I will say he had a very firm grasp of the game. The game is different. Um, it took, I watched a lot of good football minds uh, take a couple of years to understand what they got themselves into. Mm-hmm. And it's not football. It's different. And you can't, you can't, you can't have the same thinking uh, from a head coach, particularly on the offensive side as to what you're going to be doing out there because it just doesn't work. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a, a quick, funny story. Mm-hmm. Um, this is after I had become commissioner and I sold the team, the, the, the new franchise um, to Phoenix. And, you know, they, they brought in Danny White, uh, pretty high, you know, pretty high level coach. Yep. And they played, I believe their first game, um, pretty sure it was their first game was in Albany. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd gotten to, to, uh, know, uh, Jerry Colangelo pretty well. And his son, Brian came to the game in Albany. He was sitting up in our suite and Brian was all excited. And I, I still remember, and if you went back and got the game tape, I think this is what you'd find. Dallas, or Dallas, uh, Phoenix got the ball and, it was full back left for a yard. Second play was full back right, maybe for a yard. Third play was quarterback left, maybe for a yard. And I turned to Brian and said, Brian, you got to talk to Danny. This is not how we play. <laughs> yeah, they had a horrible, I mean, but Danny White figured it out. It took him a couple of games, but they stopped with the, you can't run a football. In, I mean, you I can't you can run it three or four times a game, but it is not a, not a powerhouse, you know, run the ball up the middle uh, and I'll block everybody. This just doesn't work. But, um, yeah, we were very happy with Buff. And, and he brought in a good staff. He had good people right away. Uh, I'm trying to remember who the assistant coaches were. Mike Collins, he might have been one of the original assistant coaches. Um, but we had a we had a good staff. And, and, and the nice thing was we had, because the basketball team, we already had things like, trainers, doctors, you know, mm-hmm. all that stuff. That's what I'm saying. It fit in so nicely for us um, because we already had all those people on staff. You know, we just they finished one season. We got a couple of weeks off, and we were right into the next season. Um, I, I, when it came to stocking the, the team with players, you know, I, I think back then it was still that uh, there were a lot of – I think the, te- the league was still going in the regional uh, groupings, if I'm not mistaken, when it came to, to getting some of the players – um, but uh, when it came to ownership, I mean, were, were you uh, the type of owner who'd like to have hands on with who they were going to be bringing in or would you, or were you the type of owner where it was like, okay, let's let the head coach and the GM, let's, let's let them go ahead and dictate and, uh, to build the team. Well, first of all, I was the GM on, on both the Patroons and the, and the Firebirds. So, um, I was involved at, at the player level, but not. Um, I wasn't Jerry Jones. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I, I let coaches' jobs depend on who they pick and who they play. And so I would never dictate to a coach, um, you know, who they picked and who they played. Uh, we might run into issues uh, in terms of 
you know, working out a deal with somebody um, because even though everybody made, I think in those days it was 500 a week, um, you know, there was always extra money uh, for quarterbacks and skilled position players, which is the reality. Um, and so, you know, things had to be negotiated. I would be involved in those negotiations, but very rarely, uh, not as much in the football as I did in the basketball. In the basketball, I was more heavily involved in player personnel decisions. Football, I pretty much let Buff um, make decisions. I mean, again, they were the guys, you know, it was their job on the line. If they got the wrong guys, uh, things didn't work out too well. Now, obviously, to, to you know, uh, you started off your very first season. I mean, you only, 1998, you only ended up being three and five, but you, you drew like mad. I think you're probably one of the higher higher ranked teams in the league when it came to, to overall attendance. Um, when it came to the 1990 season, how, uh, how, how would you rate how, how you did when it came becoming a, an owner for the first time for a, a football team? Were, were you impressed with what you did or did you find some things needed to be changed at least going forward to 1991? Um, I knew we had to upgrade uh, the, the player personnel um we we didn't we had some we had some good players and and you know for an expansion team um i guess i would say we did okay but i the losing record really uh, that that didn't sit well and again we had experienced so much success with our basketball team that the the firebirds in my mind needed to you know we needed to upgrade them get them to the same level. Uh, I I don't remember the exact years, but if you went back and looked at our CBA team, Mm -hmm. um, we brought George Carl back. He was coaching in Spain at the time. And we brought George in as our coach. And we went 50 and six that year. We went 28 and no at home. Uh, No other professional team has ever gone uh, in football or basketball has ever gone undefeated at home that to me you know okay that was ultra success but three and five was like eh, you know okay for the first year but um in, in my mind i won't say i was overly disappointed but it wasn't you know i knew we could do better than that and and it wasn't at the coaching level we needed up we, we needed better skill we needed better ball players yeah and the good thing, too, people need to remember, too, when you look at your roster for that very first year, you ended up having some players which ended up becoming stars in the Arena Football League, you know, and former yep. and former coaches. Steve Tunn is a good example. Freddie Gales is a very yep. good example there, too. Gary Gusman, very well known for the for very, you know, kicker. Uh, Sylvester Bembry. Um, things did change for you guys and when he switched over to 1991. And I, I think... You know, when you look at who you had as your quarterback, I think that made, and you, you were talking about how you need to make some upgrades, that right there, getting Tom Porras in as your, as your guy in her center, I think made a, a, made a huge difference when it came to the team in 91. Absolutely. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you've you mentioned a couple of guys that were outstanding. You know, Freddie, somebody I'm still in touch with. And, and to this day, I, I've always thought, that was an NFL quality player. Um, you know, didn't get the breaks slightly off size, not quite fast enough, but guy had such hands. I mean, and he was a, he was a tough competitor. He was a very tough competitor. And, and our kicker, again, I look at that and go, how's this guy not in the NFL? I mean, he was, he was an outstanding kicker, uh, you know, and, and at a, at a much tighter space, and, and a lot of harder conditions. So, in any event, yes, I, I, that was our big switch from first to second season was upgrading the players. And, you know, football hasn't changed very much uh, even since I was playing. QDs are very hard to be a great team without a great quarterback. Yes. Yeah. It's just hard, hard to do. Also can't, also can't forget to at least mention, too, also having uh, Daryl Darryl Hammond under – uh, you know, under your roster too. It was, uh, as I said, this 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 team had had a lot of well known names, and you know, for the first time, you know, ninety one, you went six and four. Uh, I, you know, uh, you're now over five hundred. You make it to the playoffs, and you end up losing. And I've seen the game many a time, 
many a time on YouTube, Joe, because the game is the full game is on YouTube. That playoff game with Detroit, it could have been. I would consider it a heartbreaker, just considering how the game ended. Because if I remember correctly, Albany had a very good shot at knocking off that Detroit Drive team in the playoffs. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and uh, I was with Gary Vito at the time, and uh, he was ready to concede. I mean, he 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 thought they'd lost. They, he he thought we were going to beat them, and so did I. Um, yeah, that was that was. Uh, but again, it, it, oddly enough, now I looked at that season, and you know, I thought we'd made great progress. So you know, from from season one to season two, mm-hmm. uh, I thought we even though we ended up with a loss, we had held our own, and and the, the drive were still the gold standard in the league. I mean, uh, they didn't win every year, but they that's what you measure yourself against. Right. Yeah. Um, Ninety three team ended up just uh, going heading back to five hundred at five and five. Did make the playoffs again. Um, but for you, uh, Joe, there was going to be seemed to be a, a slight change in what was going to be happening going forward to the 1992 season. Um, in 90, I think it was late 91 or 92, you decided to go ahead and divest your, your ownership within the, uh, the Firebirds group. And how, how did that come about? And how did it come about that you were offered the, the commissionership for the league? Well, it was, we had a, an owner's meeting and, and um, it was not, that was not the plan. Um, Glenn and I had talked about this and Glenn was, you know, our, our, our plan uh, to the extent that we could uh, impose a plan was that, you know, Glenn was going to get more involved with the Arena League and I was going to focus more on the CBA and so when we went to the league meeting, um, you know, that was that was our plan. And, and for the most part of that meeting, Glenn did most of the talking for our team. And then there was a push among the owners that if the league was going to make it, that we needed to um, replace Jim Foster. You know, mm-hmm. that, and, and, you know that was that was a an owner's decision. I. I don't know if it was unanimous, but it was certainly the vast majority of the owners and led by the Cincinnati group. Um, Keith Sprunk was their general manager and their, their voting member, and, and Keith was the one most adamant. And so I was you know, sitting at the table, but I, I, I wasn't really um, participating all that much. I mean, Gwen was taking the lead for us. And then uh, the owner of the Dallas franchise uh made a motion to have me take over. And that was a very awkward moment, I'll tell you, because, you know, I was with my business partner and um, it, that was not in our plans. Right. You know, it, it, I, I was neither of us, no one knew that we were going to be replacing the commissioner. And as I said, our plan was for Glenn to become more involved with the arena league and for me to be, you know, focus my attention on the CBA team. So, you know, it was it was an awkward moment, but you know, it, it's also you know you're there with your peers, and they're saying, "Well, you're the guy we want," and you know, I I'm, I have as much ego as anybody else, and I always think I can do as good a job as most people, as long as I know what I'm doing. You know, it's an area that I know something about, so you know, I agreed to take the job, and uh, with that, uh, Glenn and I. Um, you know, it was. I would say it was uncomfortable enough that I bought him out his share of the CBA team. He took my share of the uh, Firebirds, and we also ended our business relationship uh, entirely. And it really had to do with I think you know, I think he was unhappy with the league's decision. Um, things happen, you know. So it wasn't something I ever aspired to do wasn't something that I had planned to do but uh, again you're with your peers mm-hmm. these are guys that you know we were in the trenches together saving this thing and believe me there are you know that that first year uh, there are some there are some funny stories about you know if you went back and looked and you said wow who owned the Washington Generals that year well you'd find out the league owned the Washington Generals that first year yeah 
Now, how did that come about? Well, that came about, I'll tell you the story. You know, we came down to meet with the the owner of the team and to get his check. And um, guy excused himself and went to the bathroom, came back a couple minutes later, and I looked at him and I went, my God, this guy's higher than a kite. And I think he just went and snorted cocaine. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, it turned out the guy didn't have any money. And this was about maybe a month before the season began. So we had a had to quickly figure out how to take over a team, how to, you know, move it from where he was going to play, which I forget. I think we ended up at George Mason University, if I remember, because I came down to negotiate the contract. So, but, you know, I've been in, in battles with, you know, the, the, I mean, battles together with these guys trying to keep the league going. So when they turned to me and said, you're the guy we want, I mean, I guess I could have said no, but I didn't. You know, I said, okay. So that's, you know, it, I, I didn't campaign for office. I, I, I was uh, recruited and nominated, and I accepted the position. Even though you said it was awkward, Joe, was it? Were you still? Were you still honored though that they would ask you to to be the commissioner? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I I I had some pretty large jobs before. You know, I'd uh, been at a cabinet level position in government out in Missouri, and you know, I'd, I'd run large organizations. I had you know, 7,200 staff out there, uh, you know, a couple billion dollar budget. Um, so it wasn't anything that I thought was out of my reach. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, when you're in with a group of peers and they're the ones that recruit you, well, that's very different. I mean, to me, that's, you know, it, it's people having observed you and worked with you for a couple of years training and saying, you're the guy that we want. And, and it was, yeah, so I was honored. There was no doubt about it. I mean, it was, you know, and I still look at it as as an honor that, you know, that, that my peers would select me. You didn't mind being the, the face of the league itself, or did you find that, I think, because Jim uh, Foster took a, a back seat sort of role with the league itself, but it, you didn't mind being the face of the league? No, I mean, I'd, I'd been, you know, the, the job that I had in Missouri, um, I was... I was uh, I ran the largest agency in the state um, with the you know uh, the most staff, the biggest budget, and all that, and the most controversial program. So I was I was not a novice in terms of having microphones in my face okay. and a lot of lights and a lot of a lot of television. And you know, you, you get it to a cabinet level job in government, and um, you're gonna you're gonna get used to the press very quickly. So, yeah, I'd, I'd had those experiences and maybe that's part of the reason why, you know, they selected me and recruited me to do the job, but that, that didn't bother me in the least. And, uh, I mean, and again, there's some funny, you know, there are just funny stories that come out. Um, Dave Lager Schultz, you, you, you mentioned the Miami Hooters. Yes. You know, um, I got to meet Lags, um, you know, he and his group decided to buy a team and, and then, you know, I met with Lags, and what are you going to name the team? We're going to name the team Hooters. And I go, oh, God damn, come on. <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> what do you mean you're going to name them the Hooters? And so I talked to Lags, and, and I understood why they were doing it. And so we made the announcement, you know. Um, and, you know, we had, we had a press conference, media conference. Actually, we did it on the phone. And, and so, you know, I knew the questions that were going to come, and, you know, how could you? How could you allow a team to be named the Hooters? And you know, I was like, well, you know, I mean, we, we got Firebirds, and you look at the NFL, you got Bears, and you know, you got the Cubs. And what's wrong with a couple of owls? I don't, I don't see the problem. And you have to do those things. You just yeah. have to, you just have to tough them out. And you know, we all have flack from it at the time, but you do what you got to do. And you know, but that that was that was one. That was just a funny, you know. You do those media things. We had another one. You, you know enough about the league. You remember Arch Schleister? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, here's another media crisis. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we had worked out an arrangement um, with Vegas that they would put a line out on the games, and we had a central guy there. His name was Roxy Roxborough. Roxy used to be the line setter for all professional sports. 
And the deal was that, you know, they would circle the games with max bet $500 and they would inform us if there were any issues. And so I got the call one day. Our police are betting on games. <laughs> that's not good. That's not good. That's, that's, you know, thank you for the information. So I called Sprunky, and Sprunky was the general manager for Cincinnati, and said, Sprunky, we're going to have to get rid of Schleister. And we argued for a little bit, and then Sprunky said, you're right, you're right, we'll, we'll, we'll cut him today. And, you know, what are you going to announce? I, yeah. said, I don't know what we're going to announce. Let me think about it. You know, we're going to have to announce something. So if you went back and looked, you know, we put out the, the press release saying that Art had retired from Marine football for physiological reasons. And I can remember the phone calls. Or, what does that mean? What do you mean, what does it mean? Physiological reason. Look it up. You know, I, I wasn't going to get it. We were going to burn the guy. And, yeah. you know, we didn't want to. So, you know, you have these media crises. But, you know, hell, I've been, I've been through much worse in government, you know, when we had serious, you know, life and death crises. So, you know, a guy betting on, on games or, you know, a, 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 a funny name for a team. I mean, to me, that was just like, I, I, that was not enough to get worked up over. That was just, you know, mild everyday stuff. But the amusing things happen. So is it, so the Shisha thing happened after the 92 season or is it 93 when you uh, let him go? I don't want to say the word ban, but when you let him go from the league, was that 93? I think that was. I, I, I you, you have a better memory of this than I do, but I, I, I just remember the how we how we fronted it with the press. Okay. And my conversations with Keith. So I, I think it was a '93 season, but yeah, we banned him. I mean, you know, yeah. there, there wasn't any there wasn't any discussion, um, and you know, I can't say Cincinnati. Uh, the owner was. I remember Ted, I can't think of his last name right now. They own the, the big barbecue place in uh, Cincinnati. But in any event, you know, Sparky and I worked it out, and, uh, you know, Swisha's agent called, and he complained, you know, how can you fire this guy? How can you ban him from the league? And I said, look, here's the press release. He got a copy of the press release, and he was complaining about it. And I said, you know, I'll write the other press release that Swisha was betting on games. So I don't really care which one we release. So that was the end of that discussion. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, there's, just, there's just things you have to do. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I got to know Art and his wife. And, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it's a tragic story. And, you know, I took more late night phone calls from Mimi, his, his then wife. And, I mean, it's a sad story. Um, but when you're, you know, when you're involved, and trying to make a league go, you have to do things. And, and so, you know, I, I watch things that go down and people criticize commissioners for decisions. And, and I just go, you know, you don't understand how the other side of this equation looks. If you were on the other side, you don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. You have to, sometimes you just do things that, you know, you don't like, but they're, that's, your job is to make sure that the league survives and thrives. Yeah. And so all the decisions I made were, I didn't, there, there wasn't any personal reasons for any of the decisions I made. They were all, I made decisions based on what was best for the league. And um, you mentioned before that you, you you knew somebody in Las Vegas. Was this the very first time, is this possible to say that that was the first time ever that uh, betting was allowed on arena football was back in, I guess, 93 when you were, uh, when you when you made that deal, I guess with with one of the casinos or one of the the, the bookies in in uh, in Las Vegas. Yeah, um, Spunky and I, Keith Spunk and I went out um, and met with Roxy Roxborough. I forgot what Roxy it used to be like America's Line or something like that. Okay. Um, but <laughs> and and you may have your own visions of what you know the number one. Uh, sports betting odd setting person looks like. Um, but it's not, you know, slick Sam. Roxy was a CPA um, and a uh, math whiz, and it was, it was all numbers. And I learned a lot from Roxy. And, you know, his when we came out to talk to him, he was like, why would we want to get involved in this? And, and so we ended up paying Roxy. We paid Roxy a, a fee 
for the first season to set a line. And, and again, you know, uh, some behind the scenes stories. Uh, our director of football operations worked with Roxy every week to help set the lines on the games as best we could inform him as to what we thought the, all the strengths of the team were. I guarantee you, without being able to back this up, the same st- stuff is going on with the XFL. And those lines, how do you set lines on teams that have never been in existence before? I agree. <laughs> okay. You go to the pros and they run the numbers and you help them set the numbers. And that's as, you know, and, and for us, I'll tell you what it was about. We got two inches by two inches of space in every newspaper in the country or every major newspaper in the country every day. Mm -hmm. You know what it cost us? Nothing. Wow. We didn't didn't pay to put those lines in. They published those lines. So it was was the best 25,000 we ever spent. Yeah. No kidding. So that was, that was, uh, that was the 92 season or was that the 93 season when the whole thing? Again, you'd have to go. It was the first year that I took over as commissioner. Okay. 92. 1992. 92. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was the first year. Okay. Because that was one of the first, you know, we, we cut the deal with the SPN. We got the contract worked out with them. Uh, we brought in the NBA owners. Um, that would have been, the NBA owners came in after the 92, after the first year, because I was out recruiting them. And it would have been at the 92 Arena Bowl that we got those deals worked out, both with, um, Jerry Colangelo in Phoenix and uh, Red in uh, San Antonio. Okay. Now, also, and I, I, I know we were t- talking about you know what you did as the commissioner stuff like that, and I came across this one bit, uh, Joe, and I had to at least ask you. Uh, obviously, there was a, a change when you were just mentioning Arena Bowl. There was actually a, a slight change or a, a big change to the actual Arena Bowl trophy that year, and I came across this little tidbit saying that you may have had a hand in it because. You actually were able to speak with a jeweler friend of yours, Tom Fox, to help design the new Foster Cup. Is that true? Well, it, yeah. Um, first, of all, it's Harvey Fox. Oh, Harvey. And, okay. Uh, he's, Harvey. Harvey's still in business. Um, Harvey uh, used to uh, come to a lot of uh, the CBA games, and then came to all the arena games, and uh, he and his wife and. Uh, myself and my wife were, were, you know, we lived in the same town about 20 miles outside of Albany and spent a lot of time together. So we were very close. And so I mentioned to Harvey that you know, we needed to design a trophy that was, you know, meaningful and, and, you know, like other leagues had things. And Harvey told me, he said, you know, I have this silver bowl in my safe. It's been there for like eight or 10 years. And we never found a buyer for it. I think I could design this into a trophy. Um, and he came up, you know, with his design people and designed what became the Arena Bowl trophy. Uh, the only problem was that sucker weighed about 35, 40 pounds. And it was not easy to lift up over your head. <clears throat> so if you went back and looked at some of the pictures of players, you know, you they grab those things and they hoist them up in one hand. Well, no one was one of I mean, maybe our linemen were going to one hand. I wasn't going to one hand it over my head. I can tell you that. Yeah, it, it, it was a so, it, it was a big trophy, obviously, and and <laughs> c- compared to what the league had prior with the with the Hardy's Cup, and then the I, I I can honestly say the atrocious trophy that was used for Arena Bowls four and five that the, the net trophy. I don't know what else to describe it as, Joe, but um, yeah. Yeah, the, the this was a this was a huge upgrade for uh, for the Arena Football League and for for the Arena Bowl. So um, that that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, and, yeah, it was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, it was my idea to put the uh, you know the the, the uh, quotation in there, the man in the arena quotation, which was on the trophy. And, uh, yeah, it was a classy looking trophy. I mean. The, the, and I've, I've heard that it was subsequently stolen by one of the, the teams in the later years. Um, actually, it was the second iteration of the Foster Cup that was that was taken. Ah. Yeah, yeah. It, it that was, was also, by the way, it, it was that was one of my 
proposals to the league. And part of it was, you know, Jim wasn't happy getting booted to the side. Um, but I respected the hell out of Jim Foster. I mean, whatever, you know, people think that we had issues. One or I, I, the guy invented the game. And I don't care what else anyone, you know, you didn't, you didn't like him personally or didn't like him, you know, professionally. It didn't, didn't make any difference. You have to respect the man. And so it was my motion to the, to the board that we officially changed the name of the, the trophy to the, the Foster Cup, which I thought was fitting. So, yes. Ah, so glad to get out of that dang time travel machine. Where'd you go? I went back to the 80s to grab some of that good, good sports merch from my favorite defunct franchises. I spent my life savings on that machine. You bought a time travel machine to buy sports merchandise. Yeah, gladly. You know you could have gone to 503 Sports, right? The the website? Uh, yeah, no, I didn't think of that at all. Yeah, they sell all sorts of throwback sports merch from leagues like the World Football League, XFL, UFL, and the Arena Football League, several others. Uh, oh, shoot. Yeah, they sell hats, shirts, even custom jerseys from all sorts of vintage sports teams. Oh, man, I spent, like, a lot of money on that time travel machine. Well, look, listeners of AFL Rewind get 10% off their first order by using the promo code ARENAFAN at checkout. That might help you out. Yeah, it does. Go on over to 503-sports.com and, and get your merch today. Do you know anyone who wants to buy, like, a overpriced time travel machine? No, no, sorry, I, I don't. The Arena Football Hall of Fame has returned, and we want you to become a part of the family. Introducing the Arena Football Hall of Fame Patreon. Whether an all-star or a Hall of Famer, our reasonably priced tiers each have their own exclusive perks. Early access to the AFL Rewind podcast, honorary selection committee member, and much more. Help us build a Hall of Fame we'll all be proud of. Head to patreon.com slash AF Hall of Fame to join during your time as the commissioner, you were in at least a part of, and I'm curious to know your thoughts about this, of a couple of things that the Arena Football League really had not done in their time. And people need to remember, too, that this is only a league, you know, when you're a commissioner, this is only a league that had been around since, you know, for, for five you know, five to seven years that, you know, you're for your tenure. Besides the, the, the Foster Trophy itself, during that time in 1992, and this is right after you, you became commissioner, you're one of the first commissioners to actually openly look and openly mention uh, uh, another country, which was Canada, at looking at doing a uh, some sort of expansion into Canada. And at that time, it seemed to be that the city of Ottawa was very uh, was on, high on the league's list. Uh, what, what are you able to tell us about uh, the idea of actually looking into another country for the Arena Football League? Well, we actually had two cities, um, Ottawa. We had two ownership groups that approached us that were interested in acquiring and re-franchise um, two cities in Canada. Mm-hmm. And one was Ottawa and the other was Vancouver. And we had serious negotiations with both groups. Uh, the Ottawa group was much more aggressive. Um, they came out to uh, one of the arena bowls we met there. Um, spent a lot of time with that group. They were, um, I, in my mind, uh, trying to line up votes uh, throughout the Arena Bowl. And so the agreement was we would do an exhibition game up there and see what kind of response that got. The Vancouver group, um, it, we simply um, ran out of contact with them. I mean, they were very aggressive for, I'd say, about six months. And then I don't know what happened to them. They just kind of fell off the uh, the radar map, and we didn't have any further discussions with them. So, um, in my mind, it made a lot of sense as well. Um, the Arena League, uh, Canada is a place that has a football foundation, so we didn't have to sell the sport. It wasn't like going into Europe or, you know, going into Mexico or South America or someplace that doesn't have American football. Right. Canada has American football, so it was really a variation as opposed to trying to sell a whole new product. So it made an awful lot of sense to me. Um, And it still does because again, you have to remember what a, what an arena football field looks like. It's a basketball court or a hockey rink, right? That's what it is. That's the, it, it happens to be the dimensions 
And so it works very well. And obviously there are a lot of hockey rinks in Canada and, and we were interested in that. We knew that this was a filler sport. It would fill in uh, dead time for owners of NHL teams, and they were certainly on our radar. That's what, that's what we were looking at. Now, obviously, there were issues which I, which I don't think the league was involved in, where, uh, unfortunately, the, the CFL got involved um, and for some reason did not like the idea of another football league coming into their backyard, so to speak, and so that they weren't able to hold the game actually in Ottawa, uh, and they had to move the game over into Hull, Quebec, which is just over the river uh, from Ottawa. For, uh, based off the, the low turnout, and the, by the way, the game is between, the exhibition game is between the, the Albany Firebirds. Gee, what, what a tie there, Joe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Albany Firebirds and the and the Tampa Bay Storm. Uh, unfortunately, the, the game itself only drew about 1,000 people, give or take. Based off the, the result, is it that, that the league backed away or is that the ownership group from Ottawa backed away just because of... I guess the issues that they were currently having with the uh, with the Ottawa Rough Riders and that ownership group from the CFL. Uh, it was not the league's lack of interest. We we never lost interest in Canada. The ownership group um, backed off. I mean, after that, I think they were extremely discouraged by the turnout. There were so many things that went on before that game, not the least of which was getting you know uh, pushed out of where we wanted to be right. and having the CFL you know, become very aggressive uh, in protecting their turf. And and again, it made no sense to me. You know, we were, in my mind, we were not threatening. We were expanding, you know, the, the, the football industry um, and doing it in a way that didn't really threaten the CFL, but they didn't see it that way. And uh, that was unfortunate because I still think it would have been a great, foothold for the arena league and it would have made an awful lot of sense for nhl teams to have that fill-in uh, that we could provide i mean we were you know our our goal was to basically be from memorial day to labor day that that's what we saw as our season and it got off track you know sometimes off of that but that was that was the goal yeah. it was to be a filler league and again uh eventually nba teams found it to be you know, those that had owned their arena in particular um, found it to be a perfect filler. And I, and I still think that HL teams, if they had been a little uh, more open-minded, uh, and if we didn't have the, the CFL uh, quite so aggressive, I think we could have been a good fit uh, in Canada. Um, the, uh, j- just, just so people know, is that uh, the, the league finally did return to Ottawa for, for what should have been a two-game series, but it was a one-off back in 98. Um, but they did return to Ottawa but uh, j- for a, a, an actual um, uh, regular season game, but uh, that did not to amount to anything. Right. Give us some insight on, on what you wanted to do as the commissioner and, and the league, what the league wanted to do when it came to getting on television. Obviously, these are the early days uh, of ESPN. You still had, I think Prime was still around. There were no Fox Sports back then. Uh, you know, not none of these big, huge networks and sports networks were out there to to broadcast the league. What what was the what was your position in trying to get more eyes on the sport itself? Well, it was exactly that. I mean, we, we were, you know, I would love to have uh, uh, had the the choices that are available now. I mean, the XFL uh, being on, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, and, and you look at that and go, but they just started out. How do they get these great, you know, because there's, there's competition now for live sporting events. Um, we didn't have that luxury then. I mean, we, were, we were stuck with negotiating. Uh, the best deal we could. And the best deal wasn't great. I mean, the ESPN was very supportive, um, but we were dealing with a situation where they weren't about to lay out a lot of money. We, we weren't going to get uh, a lot of money from the network to do our games. And so we needed to have more eyes on the product. So we needed, in my mind, to be on TV and we negotiated the best deal that we could with the ESPN and it put us on you know, we got on TV, and that was that was a big deal in terms of making us look like a real league. It was similar to what we spoke about earlier, where I was talking about, 
yeah, you know, why did you want to have a betting line on the game? Mm-hmm. Well, because it, it gets people interested in following the sport. And so we went after those things. And, and, I, and I, I, I now, again, I'll go back to the XFL. You look at what the XFL is doing. Yeah, they're, you know, they're in the best arenas, the best stadiums they can be. They're not the best out there. But I've gone to games. I've been to two of them now. And, you know, they look pretty good in live. They look great on TV. They've got TV contracts. And they have a betting line. And it was just, I was just listening to the local radio an hour or so ago, and they were talking about, well, here's the line, you know, the, the betting line on this week's game. I'm thinking, damn, that is so good. that they, I mean, it's just free advertising. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Um, was there any, any thought of going elsewhere, maybe making your own television network, so to speak, and, and broadcast the games? Or ESPN really at that time, you know, that time for cable sports, that was the best fit? That was, we never thought about, and we had people on, on our ownership group that had experience in, in dealing with broadcasts, and, and it, it, we just couldn't make the numbers work. Now, the ESPN deal, um, as I recall, and I may, be, you know, may not have all the details uh, uh, that I'm recollecting, but it was a pretty straightforward deal. Um, we gave them the game, and we got the advertising revenue. So we, you know, we, all those spots that were on uh, our games were general revenue for the week. Some of those spots were taken by ESPN for advertisers they already had in hand, and and we went out and sold the rest. Um, At that time, for those who don't know, who who were the major... Uh, the major uh, advertisers for the league? Because obviously if you follow the league back in 87, as an example, I know USA Wet was a huge, you know, and Hardee's, especially Hardee's in the Hardee's Cup. Hardee's? Yep, so Hardee's. Uh, and I think we had, uh, I think we had at least one beer sponsor at the time. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I don't remember which one it was. Um, and then we had, if you went back and looked at, at uh, some of the advertising, it, we had where we had contacts. I mean, they, you know, they weren't all national firms. Uh, so, you know, th- there were some spots that we were selling in the local market uh, because we had contacts there. So it, it was, we sold everything we could. And did we make money? Uh, we made a little money. I mean, it wasn't a great revenue producer. It wasn't anything where we were able to, cut up a large pie like the NFL uh, or even the XFL was able to do. But the goal was to get our product out there and on a regular basis. And so, you know, that it, whether we made money or not, if we broke even, we were happy with that. Yeah. Um, obviously, with, with today's, the way things are with the Internet and stuff like that, Joe, is that, you know, everybody tries and look what the XFL has done. They, you know, they're trying to get, you know, their merchandise out there for the fans. And I've seen I've seen the history of how the league tried to do, tried to sell merchandise, you know, whether it was the, the local teams themselves actually selling. And at one point, the league itself tried to, I guess, have their own catalog, so to speak, where fans would, would order it through the league and, you know, whether it be T-shirts, hats or, or whatnot. Um, what was the, what was the league's thought when it came to merchandise? Was it something that you were trying to push on the teams themselves, or were you trying to uh, actually get a national footprint and get fans from across the country and across, you know, and, and across North America to to buy directly from the league? Well, it, you know, things have changed a lot. It, 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 go back to uh, when when I was involved. You know, internet sales were not. That was not a big deal. Right. Um, you know, in today's market, obviously, we would centralize everything and, you know, do everything out of the, the league, uh, much like leagues are doing uh, themselves. Most of most merchandise sales, uh, when I was involved, were at the local level, and we didn't have a lot of people clamoring to buy things. And, again, we didn't have the Internet infrastructure that exists today. If, if that had been part of the deal, we would have marketed it very differently. But most of the, the the league advertising, I mean, the league uh, sales, merchandise sales, were done at the local level. Okay. During your time as commissioner also, you happened to be the commissioner at the time for the very first Arena Football League All-Star Game, which came about because, yep. of, the, uh, because of the flooding that happened in the Des Moines and Iowa areas at that time. 
Um, can can you give a, a give us a little bit of of information on the All Star Game itself? I mean, was it a fully an idea that came from Jim Drucker? Because obviously, what seemed to lead to him getting the the Iowa Barnstormer, so I guess it was kind of a test game. But um, what uh, uh, what do you remember specifically about uh, about the All Star Game, which we could actually say is really technically it is the very first and only All Star Game in Arena Football League history, All right? Well, you know, Jim's plan was to to have a team in Iowa, and I think I, I mentioned earlier, you know, he originally had reserved the name mm-hmm. um, um, uh, the Nighthawks, which so you know when when the flooding happened in Des Moines, uh, Jim called me and he had the idea of you know can we do an exhibition game, and the more we talked about it, as we talked, it, that discussion evolved. Well, why do an exhibition game? It's going to be hard to do anyway. Why not do an all-star game? And we hadn't done anything like that in the league. And so um, it was a, a discussion. I mean, the decision to, with that idea of having an all-star game came out of that discussion. Um, and, you know, I, I, the owners were very receptive. I mean, we were very supportive of Jim. I, you know, I've said before, Jim, Jim gets all the credit for creating this game. Mm-hmm. And it was a good way for us to kind of introduce um, you know, the concept of arena football to that market and try to do something good for the market. Um, and, and the flooding in Des Moines was devastating. I mean, I remember how, just how bad the city looked at that point. So it was something we wanted to do for the city. It was something we wanted to do for Jim. It was something we wanted to do for the league. And it was a nice way for some of our better players to get some recognition. So, you know, everybody, you know, all of the owners had to throw in money for that. I mean, we didn't, that there wasn't the kind of thing where, oh, we're going to make money off of this. Right. Uh, we, we, every owner put money in. And again, that's one of those ones where, you know, I have to go around and you know, <laughs> get owners lined up to do things. It's not always the easiest thing in the world. And, and, um, you know, I was still, even though I, I wasn't in charge anymore, you know, it was still, it, those are things that you got to go around and get guys to do. Yeah. Um, and, but, but we did fine. We did fine. It seemed, yeah. And I said, I think I remember correctly, all the, I think the proceeds were going to go towards a local, uh, I guess to, to the rebuilding itself or to local charities there in Des Moines to help yes. with, with the flooding itself. Um, you know, the game, uh, seemed to go off without a hitch on August 20, what is my date? August 28th, 1993. Um, th- did any players? Because obviously it was a a treasure trove of players that were that were playing in the game. And the only picture that I have seen of this Joe is from the I think it was from the Des Moines Register, and it is a picture of uh, George LaFrance holding a yeah. uh, either holding his fist up or holding a ball up. That's the only picture that I think that I've seen that has ever existed personally. So I, I'm sure there's some other stuff out there, but um, oh, there's game film with that. Oh wow, yeah, like, you know, like, wow. You had to tell me that, you Joe. You down. had to tell me that. <laughs> you should track down. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to get. If you track down uh, Gene Nudo, he'll probably know where that game film is. Oh, okay. I will do just that. I will do just that. Um, but the going to the talking about the players themselves. Did any of them have even have a second thought about not playing in this game for for the people of Iowa? No, no, not at all. I mean, you know, we, it, it, our players were. Um, you know, guys who wanted to play football. I mean, you, you know, they weren't making a lot of money on a per game basis. I mean, you, you know, the, the uh, XFL uh, has this logo now, you know, for the love of the game. Let me tell you, anybody who played arena football mm-hmm. played it for the love of the game. They yes. didn't play it for, for the money. Um, and, you know, these are guys that, uh, you know, many of them had jobs uh, at that point uh, that they could have gone to, but uh, we didn't have any problem rounding up, you know, Running up teams, and uh, I don't maybe been one or two guys that we invited that didn't accept, uh, but uh, we had a much higher acceptance rate uh, than the NFL gets for its uh, all star, I, I guess, game. Uh, nice. <laughs> especially where it's located now, especially in between the soup now, you know, in between the soup, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah. the, cha- the conference championships and the Super Bowl. What were, what were your challenges as commissioner? We're, we'll get to, you know, your your next you know your next level when it came to the came to the AFL here in a couple of minutes, but 
in the in the you know, we weren't really you know you weren't commissioner for for a full two years, but I mean you were there for uh, enough time. But what what were the challenges? The biggest challenge for you as commissioner that that you feel that uh, um, uh, that co- that uh, that didn't allow you to do exactly what you wanted to do. Well, you know, first of all, any commissioner and probably goes for every league uh, all the way down to uh, Pee Wee leagues. Um, you know, you're dealing with uh, an ownership group uh, that is a group of owners that are, these are all bright, successful people. Uh, no one there uh, uh, is a small ego person. Uh, so, you know, just getting a group of people who have been successful in their own right, who have opinions on everything, who are used to doing things their way, and getting them to row together, um, that's a difficult task. I mean, I, I, I look at leagues, all sorts of leagues, and the criticisms that are you know handed out to commissioners. And if you haven't been there, you really don't know how difficult it is. You're sitting around a, a, a table with eight or ten people and trying to convince them to do the same thing. And, you, you know, you're just trying to get everybody on board. Hmm. It's not enough to have a majority. It, you have to be able to sell an idea and, and be able to back off ideas that you weren't able to sell. So, you know, the, I think the hardest thing for, for any commissioner, and certainly the, the what I faced was, hey, guys, we need to do something about this. Here's, you know, here's a proposal. And then... Going through, we had some pretty loud meetings uh, during the time that I was commissioner. I can't say they were all, you know, uh, quiet and, and uh, sedate. So, you know, there's a, it's just a matter of getting people to put the interests of the league ahead of their own interests. And so that, 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 to me, was the biggest challenge. And and we were able to do a lot of things. I mean, we got, you know, I, I can't say everyone was happy all the time. But there was a lot of politicking that I did behind the scenes to mm-hmm. get people to agree to things. I mean, it, everything sounds simple until you try to get it done. You know, the year that, you know, we had a deal worked out with the Zubas guys, they, they would provide uniforms. Well, some of our owners didn't like the uniforms. How do you get out of that situation? Look, guys, we're getting free uniforms. Yeah. What do you mean you're not going to, what, what do you mean you're not going to put your players in them? <laughs> so. It's a, it, you know, those were the, the, the day-to-day things. And then, as with any new league, it's always money. I mean, you're always worried about whether a team can sustain. For example, looking over, like, some of the, some of the teams, um, Milwaukee. Milwaukee had great. They, they, when, when they came in, they had tremendous support and, and from uh, local businesses. Now, in part, that's because the owner was in the advertising field and had a lot of contacts. Right. Um, but the the Albany team, uh, both when I was part owner of it and, and later when Glenn owned it outright, we were never able to get money uh, from from local companies. We just didn't have that many companies. We didn't have that many companies that were willing to put money in. Um, so I can tell you, for example, that, you know, that's what eventually uh, led to the CBA team also leaving Albany. We couldn't get any money. The last year the CBA team played in Albany, we had to change the name of the team from what had been its name from the beginning, the Albany Patroons, to the Capital Region Pontiacs. Why did we do that? Because the Pontiac dealers threw in $25,000 and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um and and we needed the money to be able to put the team on the court. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, it, you know, if I I'm looking over the the, the, the years now and the teams you're in as well, if you looked at uh, the teams that did a great job of bringing in local revenue, uh, the Arizona Rattlers, it's unbelievable. I went to the Rattlers first game. They were full, obviously, because they made the season tickets for the Rattlers part of the season tickets for the Suns. Right. So that was an easy spell. But this, the, the arena was full of people with Rattlers. You know, they, they had the shirts. They had, they had merchandise. They had promotional items. They, they already had their own, you know, uh, uh, Rattler uh, 
snakes that they would bring out, you know, much like people do with those long bone things. And, you know, it was, it was amazing. Now look over other teams, um, Cincinnati, Cincinnati, fantastic. Keith Sprunk was their general manager. He was a whiz at, at signing people up. They had, they had, again, they came in in, in 92. They had several times the revenues from sponsorships that Albany had, even though they were a brand new team. And of course, you know, they, they were the first ones to bring hot tubs into the arena. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, Sparky, Sparky was, Sparky was, uh, an interesting guy. Um, but as you go down and you look at, you know, the, how, how teams came in and wh- why they succeeded financially, they didn't succeed financially. A lot of it just had to do with being able to generate revenues. There's only so much you can get out of tickets. You're only, you're playing a limited schedule and, mm-hmm. you know, most of those arenas were, yeah, they were in the 12,000 to 15,000 range and, and they weren't selling out. So, you know, you can only get so much off ticket sales. You're not getting really much of anything off of merchandise. You weren't getting much of anything out of TV. So sponsorships really were the, the lifeblood. I mean, that's what kept teams going. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, while I was there, teams lost money. But, you know, a big loss, I think the largest loss uh, while I was commissioner, the most a team loss was about $200,000. Now, that's a lot of money. I'm not... I'm not making that like a small amount of money. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, they were probably picking up uh, before the next season started, twenty five to $50,000 out of new, you know, new franchise sales. Um, and again, these were not, for the most part, these were not guys that were looking at short-term losses as killer. But, you know, once you got out of that range and you started into losses where teams were now losing a minimum of five hundred thousand dollars, all of a sudden a million dollars. And again, this is after my time, but you know that that just is not sustainable. And that, even the NFL guys said, "No, nah, we're not doing this anymore." You know, they just they were not going to continue to lose at those kind of numbers. And again, that's kind of what broke the league. Was there ever something, because it sounds like it could be, it, it, sometimes if you, you know, obviously, you know, you, you're basically, a, you know, a senator or whatnot, but you're actually, you know, you're the commissioner of the league with, with all the politicking, as you mentioned. Um, was there ever something that didn't pass that ended up, may have, that may have, um, may have showed up in years later and you were kind of, you were you were kind of proven right in an idea that should that the league should have uh, adopted. Well, in in the, at the outset, um, you know, we're setting franchise prices, and I was able to convince uh, the owners that we should offer very reasonable reduced prices uh, to what I consider to be the the future of the league. And those who are NBA teams, uh, NHL teams, uh, and and when we went to negotiate with the and, and I, I I had been given approval to negotiate whatever was necessary to get those deals done. So when I sat down with Jerry Colangelo, you know he had been negotiating with Jim Foster about getting a team for two years and never got done. Right. Uh, Jerry and I finished that deal over lunch, and. And I wanted to keep doing those deals. We did one more deal with, in San Antonio, um, slightly more, but but in the same ballpark. And then what happens is you're bringing in owners who are looking for a share of the their share of the the money that you're getting for selling franchises. And there were owners that needed more money from that pot. And so they stopped approving these reduced deals and we couldn't get more deals done. Um, I still believe that uh, if I, if I had been given, you know, outright permission to just keep negotiating deals at whatever price it took to get the deal done, we would have had another half dozen NBA or NHL teams. in. Wow. And, you know, that it, it's hard to, to say, would that have changed uh, the future of the league? I think, I think there was a mistake made in going after NFL owners. I think that was a, a tragic mistake because they have an entirely different view of spending money 
and this was, you know, this was like uh, like a mom and pop variety store compared to what they were doing with their NFL franchises. Right. And you know, all of a sudden, I mean, I was no longer involved in the league at that point, but I obviously had contacts, and I'm hearing about you know prices that are being paid for players and salaries that are being paid for coaches, and I'm just saying it is the, the league cannot sustain. You know, the NFL guys, this is a rounding error for them. They spend more than that on, you know, Gatorade uh, throughout the season. Yeah. But the the rest of the league could not maintain. And, you know, eventually it, it, it really caused a, a great rift. And I think that was that was a point when the league could have expanded in a different way and probably should have. Okay. Um, I, I do know that, uh, and I've seen this through through different newspaper articles and stuff like that. That some commissioners are, when they are commissioners, they are they are given an option to actually purchase an expansion club or to, I guess, to move a, a team to another market, uh, which they deem viable. Um, were you the first commissioner to get this? Because I know that's this lead. To, this will lead to our next, you know, portion of, of your career. But were you the first commissioner to get to that type of, of perk? I guess we could say, or or had because I mean, you were only you know, you were the second commissioner of the Arena Football League. Had that idea been floating for a while, or was it something that you had built into your contract? Um, it was actually Keith Sprunk was uh, appointed to do the negotiations, as I recall, and. Um, I, you know, I think when, no, I guess Ash was before Keith, it was before Keith came in. Um, so the negotiations were pretty much as follows. The league didn't have any money to pay a commissioner. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you know, what we were paying Jim wasn't all that much, but, um, you know, it was, it, I couldn't in good conscience ask for, these guys to dig into their pockets when they were losing money. So the deal was that my salary would be deferred or I'd, I'd have an option of taking a franchise. And that was my plan, you know, would wait and see how it played out until, you know, I got a phone call from Gary Vito just before the start of the season. I can't remember exactly when, but it was probably around this time of year saying that Mike Illich had decided actually it was, Mike Illich's wife had decided that they weren't going to field the team any longer. Right. And the Detroit drive was about to go out of business. And it was like, oh, we can't have that. We can't, you know, we can't go into the, the season, a team short. And so, you know, that I can't say that was my plan was to um, end up with a team in Massachusetts. I, I had looked long term that Boston was a market that I had set aside. And that was a market that I was going to go after. Um, but you know, things happen much faster than I intended them to happen. And we ended up, uh, you know, taking over the Detroit team. I mean, and, and those who have been following, you know, the arena football, like history, everybody knows that the Detroit drive were, you know, they were the, the first, uh, you know, team that was a dynasty and considering how well that they did, um, now, if I'm not, from what I'm seeing here is that you actually were, were I guess the new commissioner was announced only on June 1st. You know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Drucker was announced on June 1st, 1994. And this right. is already within the season itself for 1994. This is about a month in, or just uh, about, you know, about three weeks into the season. Yeah. Um, had that always been the plan? I mean, considering that you were, I guess, the commissioner at the time and part owner of the Massachusetts Marauders, I mean, was that always the the, the decision, or did I guess did negotiations go beyond that, where you ended up being commissioner uh, three weeks into the season, even though you were also the owner of the of the Marauders? No, no, no. Here's the sequence. I I was commissioner before. You know, I had taken over uh, as commissioner back. Oh, uh, I want to say maybe 92. Yes. I, I, I don't remember the exact year. I think it was 92. Yeah, 92. Um, and that's when we brought in, if you looked at the team, we, that's the year that we brought in several new teams. I think we brought in five teams that year. Uh, a couple of NBA teams, uh, NBA owners came in. Uh, and that was fine. I mean, we, you know, we, the next, next year we, um, 
you know, didn't bring any new teams, but um, we were doing all right. I mean, we were we were going along. The decision to to for me to become the create the Mass Marauders and you know convert the Detroit Drive into the Mass Marauders that was done literally uh, at the at around this time of year just before the season started. I don't. I think it was in March. It could have been a little earlier, but it was right around this time of year that Gary Beetle called and said they're not going to play. Okay. And so there wasn't any time to I me. Mean, I had to make a snap decision. I, I, I made the decision said, all right, rather than you guys folding and us being a team short, because we didn't have time to recruit a new team, I'll take the team and we'll start looking for a new commissioner. So, you know, the, the overlap of my ownership of the Marauders and my still being commissioner was, it wasn't anything that had been planned. It was just, it took us that long to recruit a new commissioner. Okay. And we had recruited somebody else. We had recruited, um, I cannot remember the guy's name. He was an executive with, uh, Turner sports and we had offered him the job. He had accepted the job. And a week later he called to say that, Turner had made him a, a better offer. And he uh, undid his acceptance of the job. So, you know, we, we went to our backup choice, which was Jim Drucker. And, you know, uh, so we didn't get Jim in. I think Jim came in and I think you're right. I think he came in in June of that year. Yeah, 94. Yeah. Interesting. I never knew. Obviously, we don't, fans don't know and historians don't know about that, that you know, that uh, commissioner number three was not going to be Jim Drucker. That's, I, you're gonna, you're now gonna try to may have to make me to do some more uh, research there, uh, Joe. That's uh, if if it's out there. That's the thing. If it's out there, because you know. Well, you, you can talk. You can you know there are people like uh, Gene Nudo who will remember this kind of stuff. Sprunky will probably remember. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I just you know there there are other people out there who were who were aware of the situation. Okay. Um, I'll make and the guy that we had recruited. I, I mean, I, I can't come up with a name from you know that many years ago, but I can tell you, I can give you the profile. He was uh, late thirties, um, uh, a Turner executive and in the, on the sports side and very, you know, it, it, that probably would have changed the history of the league because uh, there was a good chance we were going to be able to work something out with Turner sports uh, going forward. Oh. Uh, that was part of, the interest in this guy yeah. and he was a unanimous decision. And, uh, you know, Jim Drucker was a, um, it, 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 this was not a close vote. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was at the end, it was a unanimous vote, uh, for the, for the guy we offered the job to, but there was a lot of discord as to whether or not to offer Jim Drucker the job. And it finally became a, how could we be a league without a commissioner? Right. And I think, you know, Jim was a, um, he, he was, he was, we needed to fill the job and we didn't have any other candidates right. uh, at that point. Okay. Hey, this is Tim just breaking in to give you an update on the last subject we were talking to the commissioner about, which was the gentleman who was supposed to become the third commissioner of the arena football league before he backed out. And then the league decided to go with Jim Drucker. The gentleman's name was Drew Reifenberger. Uh, so uh, back to the show. Um, uh, obviously, taking over a team which is, has a much storied history as the Detroit Drive and moving them to and, – and I – even before I went to, the, to a game in Wooster, Joe, I had no clue where Wooster Mass was. Um, what- well, let me, let me stop you. Let me stop you right there. Okay. Because it's not – although – Almost everyone pronounces it as Worcester. Worcester. It's actually Worcester. Okay. <laughs> okay. You'd have to be from Massachusetts okay. to look at that <laughs> spelling and say, oh, so that's Worcester. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. that's Worcester. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but so, and I, I, again, I had to look up where Worcester was, and uh, and it's what. You know, the Arena Football League has always been known for, it's always had a mixture of, you know, the smaller cities, you know, like, like Albany, given one, and the larger cities that have been in the league. What was it? The short amount of period of time that you had in order to when you once you took ownership of the team to when you where you had to find a, a location? Because I know you said you were talking about Boston before. Was Boston originally the the location and it just didn't pan out? How was how did you end up in Worcester? 
Um, it really came down to availability of dates. Um, you know, we were late in late in moving the team. Uh, I obviously wasn't going to uh, manage the team and have it located in Detroit. So, you know, as I said, you know, when I was looking down the road, and I was looking down the road several more years, uh, it was always my interest in in having a team in Massachusetts. That's where I'm from. And where I had lived in Boston, and I thought Boston would be ideal. Now, at the time, um, you know, the contacts that I had, uh, the Albany Arena was being managed by um, the same company that managed Boston Garden. Okay. And so they were, you know, that's the first group that I turned to to see if we could work out, uh, you know, to, to locate the team in. In, at the Boston Garden, and we just couldn't get that. We didn't have dates available. We couldn't get enough dates to make it work out. So they also managed the arena in Worcester, and Bob Belber, who's the manager of the arena in Albany, suggested, "Well, how about Worcester?" And you know, by happenstance, I happened to have gone to school in Worcester. Or that's where I went to college, and so I was fairly familiar with the city and knew that. You know, it was a decent-sized city. It's, uh, I think, around the time it was around 650,000, uh, the metro area. So, you know, uh, and wanted to be, always wanted to be uh, more of a sports town. Mm-hmm. And so it's no surprise to me, you know, the Red Sox have just relocated their AAA team. They'll be playing there. They're playing there this year. Yes. Uh, built a brand-new stadium for them. And... And so Worcester was a compromise. I would have preferred to have the team in Boston from the get-go, but we just didn't get the dates worked up. And naming the team Mass Marauders was not just for alliteration's sake. I mean, I intended to move that team out of Worcester and move to Boston. Um, and so that, you know, the, in naming the team, I was already looking to complete, you know, my original idea of having a team in Boston. Okay. Now I, I I have to ask. I mean, if anybody hasn't seen the logo, it's it's, it's a very unique logo. Um, but where did the where do the different colors come from? Because I think it's, it's maroon and a a shade of I don't want to say a shade of pink because I don't have the official colors here in front of me. But and, and silver. How how did how did you come about with the with the logo itself and, and uh, deciding on what colors that you wanted to go with? Uh, we had a graphic artist do the uh, logo again. You know we had several options. Uh, that was the one we picked. Uh, the real colors uh, for the team were burgundy and silver. Okay. And, um, I, you know, that, I thought they were very sharp. We added, um, you know, you have to go back to the times. Um, at that time, that particular uh, era, uh, hot pink was, uh, you know, a, uh, it was a fashion thing. Mm-hmm. And so we added that as the, uh, the stripe on the helmet down the center. Um, it was also, um, I mean, part of part of the uh, discussion was a discussion that I had with our coach, and we talked about, you know, having helmets that are recognizable on a field is not a bad thing for a quarterback, and uh, those helmets were very distinct. I mean, you you could see all your receivers, no matter where they were, um, much like the old uh, you know, Buffalo Bills with their red helmets. So. Uh, you know, the pink was added. It was, it was, that was not part of the original color scheme. We added that just before the start of the season. Okay. Okay. And, and I will admit they, they were a very unique helmet. I mean, I, I remember what the uniforms are like and in, in the game that I saw there at the, at the Centrum. Um, what, what was, uh, what, what was, what was your initial reaction to, to the crowd and to the, fan base in Worcester because obviously you're going from Detroit which had a very again a very storied history and then you you're moving to a was summarily a, a suburb of Boston but um what was your your thought on the on the fan base and, and how they how they reacted to the team I thought that I thought we did very well I mean you know okay considering how little time we didn't have a whole lot of a couple months to announce the team you know recruit coaches uh, put together uh, our squad. I mean, yes, we brought a lot of guys over, but you know, there were some trades involved. And 
Um, but the whole idea was we were introducing the team. I mean, the, the concept that, you know, there hadn't been a, an arena team in Massachusetts uh, that wasn't something that, you know, there was any demand for. We never had any interest from any group in that area. So, you know, we had a really scramble, and I thought we got very positive fan response. I mean, it, you know, the turnout was great. Um, you know, we added a, a, a local kid who uh, – uh, you may or may not remember was uh, he played uh, two way ball at Holy Cross, Gordy Lockbaum, and he was a Heisman Trophy candidate. I think he finished second or third in the in the ballot in his senior year. And we added him to the squad, you know, to give the team some local flavor. And uh, and Gordy was was great. I mean, he was <laughs> he was uh, well past his uh, prime and. Uh, maybe a little out of his league in terms of being able to play at that level at that point, but he gave it a go. And uh, we got tremendous. I mean, I, I thought the fan response was better than I could have hoped for. Now uh, your head coach ended up being John Strzok for that, for that year in, in Worcester. Don, Don, yeah. yeah. Um, why, um, why were, were you not able to convince Tim Markham to, to come with, with the team to, uh, to Worcester? He was not interested in coming. Tim uh, had other things going on in, in the Detroit area. So once we uh, ascertained that he wasn't going to become available, we started interviewing coaches. And, um, you know, there were there are always guys, there are always football guys applying for coaching jobs. You, you never you never have to worry about, gee, we don't have any candidates. And we had, you know, a dozen or more candidates. Um, Strzok, uh, I like Don. I, I mean, I liked him from the moment I met him. And, um, you know, he had a very good grasp of what was unique about arena football and what kind of offense would work. And he, you know, short time that he had to get ready for that season, we put together a, you know, we went back and looked at our offense. I mean, we were doing things that even in, in the arena league were unusual uh, you know, first time done kind of thing, plays that people hadn't seen before. And it was really all done. I mean, he was a, he, he was a great uh, addition. I mean, I, I'm, we never looked back on, on that. And he turned out to be a, a guy that I spent some time with and got to be friendly with and uh, just an all around good guy. And we also got Bruce Hardy, um, you know, another just great guy. And, you know, a guy, these aren't guys that had coaching credentials per se, but they turned out to be great hires. So very happy with, with everything we did from, uh, you know, given the short amount of time, uh, we put a pretty good product on the, on the field for that year. The team ended up going uh, eight and four. They did uh, make it into the second round of the playoffs before losing to Orlando. Um, uh, the teams, if you know the league itself, you know the name Mike Pegel. He was their starting quarterback, and he did quite well for for the Marauders that year. And also some some other names too that 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 I think fans and football fans alone, uh, Joe would know is that you know I, I think I'm just looking at the at the rosters here real quickly, um, but th- there were some some ones like uh, well, a friend Pasquadero. We, we know exactly what he yep. came up with in the league itself. <laughs> Uh, Danny Lockett uh, is another one. Um, it, it's the team seemed to be able to carry over the the winning ways from the from the Detroit franchise. Now, for those who know, is that after the 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 eighty four season, excuse me, the ninety four season, uh, the uh, the team did not come back. Why did why did you? I, I don't want to say did you mothball the team, but why, why did the Marauders not come back for nineteen ninety five? Um, I had some major issues with uh, Commissioner Drucker um, and was not uh, willing to continue in the league as long as he was commissioner. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's, it, it began and ended with that. I mean, that, that it was, there was nothing more complicated than um, Jim Drucker. Okay. So, so for, we, the... we had a, uh, we, we had a little, um, set to at the 1994 arena bowl and the, things were pretty well after that that was pretty much uh i, I wasn't going to be back if he was back okay 
And and, and it goes back to what you were saying before. So it makes you wonder how far you would have continued with the mass marauders if if Commissioner Drucker had not been hired and that other gentleman from TNT had been. So it's yeah, it's it's like a, a what if type of situation, right? Yeah, you know, you you you, you never can go back and, and worry about what might have been. I mean, right. people do that, and it's, to me, it's it's worthless. Um, you know, I I was happy with the um, with our first year uh, in in Worcester. Yeah, we lost some money, but it wasn't a, a great deal. You know, we averaged uh, I think we averaged I don't know. 74, 7,500 a game, which was acceptable for given the short amount of time we had. We put a good product on the field, a winning product. Um, we came very close to making the Arena Bowl. And this was with a first year coaching staff, uh, you know, everything that, that we put together, we put together in about three months. Right. And so I, I look forward um, to the future. But, um, you know, this is just. This is to say that, uh, you know, my differences with uh, Jim Drucker were insurmountable. And, you know, we had this little set to at the Arena Bowl, which uh, we, we won't get into on, on, okay. on this broadcast. Sure. Uh, but suffice to say that, uh, you know, a, a line was drawn in the sand. And, uh, you yeah, know, there were owners that uh, were appalled at me. And there were owners that very were very supportive of me. And, you know, I, I just said, guys, you know, you, you need to do what you need to do. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm not coming back, you know, if this guy is still running the league. Right. Um, I thought he was a bad choice. Uh, he, he, he was, I mean, it, losing the candidate that we had all agreed upon was just a, uh, it was a turning point in the league. Um, I know we, it, it is known out there. I just want to ask a little bit about it. Um, you know, there was a, I don't know if it had to do with the drug situation too, but you, there, there was a, a, a lawsuit brought forward. And we, I know we touched on it on, on earlier uh, in the, in the, uh, in the interview, but what, um, how, how did it end up coming about where the, I guess the whole, the whole lawsuit came about? I mean, uh, I know it, se- it seemed to be from whatever they're saying in the newspaper that it had to do with uh, payment of the actual, uh, you know, when it came to the the Worcester franchise, the Worcester franchise. Uh, wh- what was the what was the catalyst of that uh, of that actual lawsuit from, uh, yourself versus the league? Well, there was a, you know, obviously you know, I have a team that I own. Um, and I announced I was not going to play. And so, you know, that, that that's a pretty drastic step. Um, we did um, negotiate a settlement agreement mm-hmm. that allowed me to retain ownership of the franchise and to sell it in certain markets. And, and, and so I was prepared to uh, go forward with that, that deal. Now, the question became, I found, an, I found a group that wanted to buy a team um, and signed a, an agreement with them, and the league rejected that agreement. Okay. And that then, to me, was, okay, the gloves are off. And this was Drucker. This was Drucker who you know, was the one who led the charge of not approving the sales agreement. Right. And at that point, you know, I... I don't like to get into battles, but, you know, the, the way in which I live my life is, you know, once the battle starts, then you're in the battle. You know, right. you, you don't worry about anything else except winning. And and so, you know, when the league said, no, you, we, we're not going to approve your deal, then to me that was they had started the battle. And so, you know, I, I ended up. You know, and we got into this a little bit in the la- earlier discussion about, right. um, yeah, you know, I, I, I put the league in a very difficult position. and But I didn't start this fight. And so once I started the fight, to me, it was, what did you expect me to do? Did you expect me to simply allow you to say no, and that was going to be the end of it? And I wasn't going to be able to sell my franchise after all? Or am I going to sue you and bring you to court and put Quinn Zoom on the stand and basically put the whole league at risk. And so it wasn't pleasant, um, but uh, everybody survived. You know, it's, it, it was a battle that didn't have to happen. If they had just let the first deal go through, we would have never had any court battle. None of that 
other stuff would have happened. Right. Um, do you happen to know, obviously, with the, after the, the lawsuit was settled and whatnot, do you remember uh, where the uh, the rights to the Massachusetts Marauders franchise ended up? In what city? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, it ended up in Grand Rapids. Oh. I told them to... Uh, that that is where the Grand Rapids franchise came from. I mean, you wouldn't find that necessarily if you tried to trace the lineage, but the the Grand Rapids Rage, I think, a rampage, uh, rampage, rampage, rampage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. We have the Charlotte Rage and then the Grand yeah. Rapids Rampage. Yeah, <laughs> um, it was uh, actually um, the Amway family that uh, bought the team, the DeVos family. Yes. Okay, yep. interesting. That's, uh, okay, that's 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 pretty cool to hear. And and last thing, it came it's from one, from one of my co-hosts. He wanted me to ask you a question, and he said this is a question that that he feels that every commissioner should be asked: is um, what version of the league do you think was the best fit to survive long term? The going national model with big sponsorships and broadcasts, or the local model of grassroots teams? I don't think either of those models were the best. I, I think the model that where we were headed, which is a mixture of owners who already had other professional teams, NBA owners and NHL owners are the ones that I concentrated on, uh, having them as kind of a, uh, a base uh, because they could sustain things that small markets could not. And they gave us stature in terms of negotiating TV contracts. Mm-hmm. So I still think the best mix for the league would have been a half a dozen to a dozen NBA NHL owners, and then a a you know comparable number of local markets where it was the only professional team or the major professional team. Uh, that's why the Albany Firebirds were so successful. They didn't compete with anything else. Um, yeah, they had some an AHL team a few miles away, 30 miles away. Uh, we had the CBA team, but football is football. Yeah. And there wasn't any competition for football in the Albany market at the time. Right. So, you know, I think you can pick off the, the cities, you know, and it, it, it's interesting to me the number of cities where we played that eventually got other teams. Yes. You know, um, you know so it's not, you know, it, Tampa and or not Tampa, but Orlando was a was a perfect market for us. Um, you know, they're not Tampa, uh, but they are Orlando. Right. Uh, Charlotte was a great market. You know, uh, Albany was a great market. Worcester was a great market. And if we had gone into Boston, we would have done even better. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's I don't think either of the. Uh, the models you described are the ideal models. I think it's a blend of both. OK. And finally, uh, arena football, do, do you find that arena football was a flash in the pan in the 90s idea that somehow survived? Or is it a sport that really has eternal legs in the sports ethosphere? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult for the league to come back now um, simply because, I mean, you only get so many failures. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, we have a new bridge from the Super Bowl to what should be the arena football season. Right. And that's called the XFL. Yeah. So if you look at the XFL is filling in from the Super Bowl till basically Memorial Day, the arena league should be back in the slot that we had it, which was Memorial Day to Labor Day. And, you know, fill in, don't compete with anybody else, concentrate on the fact you're playing indoors, you know, focus on the fact that these are not for the most part NFL players and go back to the two way, the concept of two way football rather than getting away from it. And, mm-hmm. and I, I think we had the right ideas back when <laughs> I think 92, 93, 94, I think we had the right ideas. I think, you know, that they, they got off the path on several fronts. Yeah. Uh, when you look back at your, your tenure as commissioner, Joe, um, uh, how do you want people? I mean, as I said, you're, you're such a uh, you're small, but you're such a large part of the history of the Arena Football League. How do you want people, whether they're just new to the league, just learning about you and your history, or those who are who knew about you going all the way back to the days of the Albany Firebirds? How do you want people to remember you and your tenureship as commissioner in the AFL? 
Well, you know, I, what I would say is um, I was I, w- I wouldn't say I was a reluctant commissioner, but I, you know, I was asked to do this job and I was asked by a group of my peers who wanted a change and wanted someone in charge that they trusted that they thought could get the lead to the next level. And uh, you, my acceptance of the job was really uh in, in my loyalty to these guys and my recognition that as I looked around, we didn't have a lot of other people that I thought could do as good a job as I was able to do. So I never lobbied for the job. This was something that, you know, like many things happen in life, uh, it's kind of thrust upon you, or at least the opportunity is. But you know, what I tried to do is always put the, the lead's interest uh that was all I really cared about. I mean, yes, uh, you care about individual teams, individual owners, but you're always looking at is the league going to be better because of whatever decision I'm making or whatever action I'm recommending or whatever. And that's you know, the, all I, all I would ask is that I'd be remembered as someone who tried to keep the league on track, tried to advance it, tried to make it better than it was when I took over. And you know, that, that was guided by that principle that the league is more important than any individual or any individual team. So I want to give uh, thanks to uh, Commissioner O'Hara for joining us on this episode of AFL Rewind. And uh, considering that, you know, it took two weeks in order to actually complete the interview itself, uh, uh, it was well worth it in my opinion, and I hope you agree with me. Um, if there are any uh, suggestions, comments, concerns or uh, uh you know uh, or people you'd like us to possibly have on on future episodes you can read us at our new email and that's at afl rewind at arenafan.com or if you want to listen to any of the archive of all arena fan podcasts you can do so by heading over to soundcloud apple podcasts google play music spotify iheart radio and our video version over on youtube So hope to see you next time on AFL Rewind. So for everybody here, I'm Tim Capper. Watch the rebound off the net.